All right, so in case we're letting people in, um, hi everyone, welcome to the event. Uh, we're just posting this to Facebook now, so give us just a moment. Okay, Dr. Harvey, it's all yours. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we are going to get started here. It's so great to um, get together and have this opportunity to discuss the 1619 Project Series. Um, just, just to give a little bit of background, the 1619 Project published by the New York Times retells the history of the United States by foregrounding the arrival uh, 401 years ago of enslaved Africans to Virginia. Through a series of essays, photos, and podcasts, the 1619 Project charts the impact of slavery on the country's founding principles, economy, healthcare system, racial segregation of neighborhoods and schools, popular music and vis visual representations. Conversations around the 1619 project have served as a flashpoint for intensive ideological debates about its content and its impact. It's been both widely lauded and subjected to critiques from academics, journalists, pundits, and policymakers who challenge its accuracy and its interpretation of history. Conservative politicians even seek to defund schools that teach the project. We ask uh, through this series, what is the power of the 1619 Project to reframe our understanding of United States history and our contemporary society? We ask how might we go beyond the 1619 Project to develop an even fuller understanding of the centrality of slavery and race in the United States and in the broader Atlantic world. So we hope that you will join us for a month plus exploration of the 1619 Project series, which will culminate in the visit of Nicole Hannah-Jones, the Pulitzer Prize winning creator and lead writer of the project. Before we get started, I'd like to just um, recognize our, our sponsors. The 1619 Project at UC Irvine is a campus-wide initiative presented by the UCI Irvine Humanity Center and co-sponsored by a number of campus organizations and offices. We'd like to extend our gratitude to those who provided funding and labor, including Dr. Judy Wu, Director of the Humanity Center and Professor of Asian American Studies, who has been central to the planning and organizing of the series, we would also like to thank Ryan Gurney, Saeed Jalilapur, and Robin Murray, the IT support, and all other campus essential workers who are present um, and whose labor we rely on to, to present this series. I'd also just quickly like to uh, remind us that even though we are in this virtual world of Zoom and Facebook Live, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we are on, or at least most of us at UC Irvine are on Tongva and Hachiman homelands. And as we hold these conversations around um, slavery and colonialism, as it is in the present, um, I hope that we will be able to also reflect on the ways in which our histories um, are intersecting. So, um, some announcements. I do want to remind folks about Nicole Hannah-Jones visit, which will be on October 29th. Um, the event uh, will begin at 2 p.m. for students. 
and 5 p.m. Uh, conversation that, which will be open to everyone. Um, those events will not be recorded or live streamed and space will be limited. So we want to encourage you to RSVP uh, very soon. Also just like to um, make an announcement about studio video, uh, excuse me, student video reflections. Um, so students are invited to share their reflections on the 1619 project through short video uh, submissions. These videos are due on November 2nd um, and we will share the link in the chat. Um, we will award about 10 $50 Amazon gift cards, Amazon, hmm? um, selected by random drawing and also featuring select videos. We'll be featuring select videos on our social media. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so without further ado, um, I'd like to start our event for the day which is entitled The 1619 Project and the Matter of Black Lives, um, which launches this series. We're featuring four UCI uh, faculty uh, to organize a cross-disciplinary conversation. Our faculty are speaking from African-American studies, history, political science, law, and drama or theater. I will introduce each faculty member now um, and then, uh, allow them in the order that I sort of introduce folks to give their initial reflections on the project. And then we'll reserve about a half an hour um, once we're, we've finished for, um, for opening up for conversation. So as I present folks, I want to just apologize for cutting down bios just slightly um, in the interest of time. Um, but of course you can all look them up um, on the web for more information about their work. So just very quickly, I am Dr. Sandra Harvey. I am an assistant professor of African-American studies at the University of California, Irvine. My scholarly and political commitments include the inter and intra sections of black and indigenous politics in the Americas and globally. Um, including Black feminist queer politics and anti-capitalist and abolitionist practices. My book project, Passing for Free, Passing for Sovereign, is concerned with the production of race and gender through surveillance technologies originating in colonialism and chattel slavery. Our speakers for today include Dr. Je Jessica Millward, um, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at UC Irvine. We're very happy to have her today. Her research focuses on comparative slavery and emancipation, African-American history, gender, and the law. She's the author of Teaching African-American History in the Age of Obama, which appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education. She is also the recipient of the 2007 Association of Black, Women's History, uh, Black Women Historians Letitia Brown Wood Award for the best article in African-American women's history for her article titled, More History Than Myth, African-American Women's History Since the Publication of Ain't I a Woman, Journal of Women's Histories. I want to congratulate um, Dr. Millward on that award. Um, her work has also appeared in Frontiers, a Journal of Women's History, the Women's History Review, and the Journal of African-American History. After Dr. Millward, um, we will be having some reflections from Dr. Davin Phoenix, who is an associate professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine. Um, a first generation college graduate, Davin researches how race interacts with various spheres of US politics to shape the attitudes, emotions, and behavior of both everyday people and political elites. His book, The Anger Gap, How Race Sh uh, Shapes Emotions and Politics, won the American Political Science Association's 2020 Ralph Bunch Award for Best Scholar Scholarly Work Exploring Ethnic and Cultural Pluralism, and was co-winner of the 2020 APSA Award for Best Book on Race and Politics. Congratulations, Dr. Phoenix, on that. That's excellent. Um, following Dr. Phoenix, we will have um, 
remarks from Dr. Uh, Karen Gustafson, um, who is the director of the UCI Center on Law, Equality and Race, as well as the Associate Dean of Academic Community Engagement. Professor Gustafsson's research and scholarship is interdisciplinary and explores the role of law in remedying uh, inequality and in reinforcing inequality. Her research over the last decade focuses on the expanding administrative overlap between the welfare and criminal justice systems, as well as the experiences of those individuals and families caught in those systems. Her current research explores the history of law in regulating African-American families and in regulating labor among poor people of various ethnic backgrounds. So we want to welcome her. And then finally, um, we'll have remarks from Dr. Zachary Price, who is assistant professor of doctoral studies in the Department of Drama in the Claire Trevor School of the Arts here at UC Irvine. As an interdisciplinary theater scholar and practitioner, Zachary researches at the intersections of African-American theater studies, black performance theory, film, and cultural production writ large. His publications have appeared in theater topics, the Drama Review, the National Review of Black Politics, Journal of Asian American Studies, and the Postcolonialist. He's completing his first monograph, Black Dragon, Afro-Asian Performance, and the Martial Arts Imagin Imagination, which seems extremely exciting. Prior to joining the faculty at UCI, Zachary taught in the Department of Performance Studies at Texas A&M University and in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA, where he was a Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow. So we are lucky to have Dr. Um, Dr. Zachary Price with us. So why don't we start with Jessica Millward and then move forward if you need um, any sort of reminder of who's next, just let me know and I'll, we'll go through that. I'll pass it over to you then, Jessica. Well, thank you, Dr. Harvey. Um, let me just apologize to you because I was the person who was reticent to give my bio on time. So I see they left you with a version that's you know 10 years old I want to point out that um, I have a book, Finding Charity's Folks on enslaved, uh, enslaved and Free Women in Maryland. I also, with Tiffany Willoughby Harrard, direct the Activist Studio West Digital Archive that was awarded um, a very um, lucrative UC, UC HBCU uh, Pathways grant. And for the next uh, two years, we just finished our first cycle. The next two years, we'll be bringing students from HBCUs uh, onto campus to learn the art of digital humanities, particularly as it relates to um, the campaign to bring home Mumia Abu-Jamal. So there you have it. I've learned a lesson. I will turn my bio in whenever Ryan asks for it um, on time. So good evening. I want to thank Professor Wu for putting this really auspicious and quite inspiring um, slate of activities together. I would also like to thank um, the, the staff and the faculty associated with the Humanities Center and the School of Humanities. To put this month together required a large team, a cross campus team, and they worked very quickly and they worked very tirelessly. So tire, tirelessly. So thank you um, for all your hard work. Tonight's paper is entitled Yimiya and Frankenstein Meet, the 1619 Project and the Matter of Black Death. So I desperately wanted to speak about something other than death. I was going to go a completely different direction. I wanted to speak about the controversy over the 1619 Project and particularly the suggestion that the country was founded in 1619 with the arrival of 20 odd Africans. I wanted to talk about how this so upset historians that even as recent as a few days ago, there's been a movement asking Nicole Hannah Jones to give up her Pulitzer Prize. And then a few hours ago, something happened. Video footage was released um, from the SWAT, from the cameras, the body cameras of the SWAT team who entered Breonna Taylor's home. And you can watch the video, the summation, or I wouldn't, quite frankly, the summation is she was slumped in the hallway. And as they were leaving, um, one of the SWAT team members checked her vital, 
her, her vital signs. They surveyed the apartment and the person who checked her, her um, vital signs said, quote, she's done. So there is a correlation between the 1619 project and Breonna Taylor's death, in particular, this notion that she's done. It is the story of two, uh, it is two stories entwined with the persistence of anti-Blackness and the ever-present reality of Black death. So for this reason, I use death both as a metaphor and praxis when discussing the 1619 project. For even though the death and specter of death is not articulated in the project in a particular, in a, in a, in a, in a big way, um, death is a protagonist in both the 1619 project and the reality of black lives. It is too simplistic to say that death is the same death espoused by scholar Orlando Patterson. The death I'm talking about goes beyond kinlessness and dislocation. It is in the accounts of sickness and terror aboard slave ships, on plantations and in modern day prisons. It is from looking at the, from seeing images of the first black president being burned in effigy to the remarks in this, about the 1619 project and in particular how diet and food waste shape African-American lives. Death was present in the decisions of enslavers um, and who they decided to throw off, throw overboard, throw off the slave ships as diseased cargo. Death was present in decisions of captives to revolt and suffer the consequences if caught, as well as death from disease, depression, and um, death of the hand of the slave owner. So the 1690 project forces us to think about death in three key ways. The first is about death in the historical imagination. The project begins noting the experience of Angela. In 1619, an African woman known only as Angela arrived in Jamestown, Jamestown, Virginia on the ship Treasurer. What was her experience aboard the Dutch man of war? We don't really know. Her status has also been the subject of great debate. Was she enslaved? Was she an indentured servant? Was she a free domestic worker? Regardless of the answer, during the course of her lifetime, Angela and her contemporaries, 19 other individuals who were on that ship with her, 19 other African individuals, witnessed the hardening of racial lines. By the end of the 17th century, blackness and enslavement were inseparable through most of the colonies. And so what is at stake that, what is at stake by suggesting that this nation found, Take two. <laughs> what is at stake by suggesting that this nation's founding occurred in 1619 when Angela and 19 others arrived? And that's one of the primary critiques of this project. Critics hold firm that the US was founded by the time of the Declaration of Independence and the drafting of the US Constitution. Again, so hostile have the critiques been that the New York Times has retracted its initial argument that 1619 can be seen as a founding date. So as a scholar of slavery and revolutionary America, the, progress, the project's assertion that the country began in 1619 was not revolutionary to me, nor was it alarming. The very questions of liberty and freedom had very real and visceral repercussions in colonial America. Centering US history around the realities of slavery dislodges the American Revolution as the moment that the US was born. More importantly, stating this country's history uh, begins in 1775, sanitizes the reality of, of the racial problems that this country has inherited. Anti-Blackness was firmly in place well before colonists protested against British tyranny. And so I offer another critique. What does it mean to center the founding of the United States at the physical and sexual exploitation of women such as Angela, particularly given that their wombs were used to repopulate the slave population? This is to say nothing of what, start, what starting the country's history in 1619 does to acknowledge the existence and actual lives of indigenous people prior to this relentless decimation that they knew to be hallmarks of their experience in what becomes the United States. For these and so many other reasons and some with real life consequences, the 1619 project serves as a point of departure for discussions and curriculum revolutions. However, Critiques, while valuable to some extent, also serve as a way in which to tell us how we view truth in this country. So the belief that hagiography is more nuanced and a better way to speak about the found, founding of the US than death 
and certain arguments that are not left to mythology. Okay, the second thing that I would like to talk about, just because of interest of time, I think I'd rather use our time talking about the actual project than hearing what I have to say. Um, but to connect the oceans theme with the 1619 project, I want to, uh, of course, call out Nicole Hannah Jones, where she speaks in her own article about when was this notion of African Americans formed? Was it in the first or second or third week on the slave ship? And how can we better understand the African American experience from the perspective of that moment before Africans arrived? To the, from the perspective of the standpoint of men, women, and children who were confined, confined to the whole of leaking waterlogged caskets or coffins, if you will. Um, the second issue is death and Black Lives Matter, or is this, this program is called The Matter of Black Lives. We know inherently there's a conversation between both the 1619 Project and what is going on in 2020 in the streets. And all of the questions center around the same thing. And it's what Nicole Hannah-Jones asked basically in her essay, what rights can black citizens expect from this democracy? And we'll talk about that later. We all witnessed Black Spring. I think that it's very obvious where I'm going with this. Finally, the third, the third way in which death is populated in the 1619 Project is by looking at ghosts of slavery and how we actually honor the dead. So if you look at the imagery for this particular session, you see um, the Vicitudes uh, sculpture that's off the coast of Granada. It stands, it stands on the ocean floor, 26 children are holding hands. And you would think it's attributed to a monument that's attributed to, the, to loss during the Atlantic slave trade. But yet the, the sculptor actually denies this purpose. He said that he, broke, he made the sculpture because it, pointed, it provided Granada a relief. He said <laughs> that he uh, did the sculpture because it created a, a, a break from Granada, for Granada's reef, right? So he was trying to be mindful of the environment of the sea and the local culture. But there's so many people make this connection between the Middle Passage and death at sea speaks to the need to reconcile this horrific history of slavery. In essence, for many, the sculpture functions as a way to make peace with the past and they provide an outlet to honor the, those who lost. So I began by saying this is about Yimiya, um, the Risha God that protects the waterways and Frankenstein, a creation of man's own doing. It is not enough that a Risha and, such as Yimiya and ancestors call back from the past and call for us to rectify the murder of countless Africans. The consumption, the consumptive nature of greed and the ethereal energy around death cannot be cannot be monetized or demarked by simple memorials. This memorial is great. We know for the last two to three years we've been not we, but some campuses and some cities have been besieged by having to take down their tried and true monuments and memorials. That's a different kind of reconciliation. What I want to say here is the specter of death, the ghosts of slavery are ever present. The dead and the dying are so ever present in the 1619 project during this moment we're living in right now with the pandemic and certainly what we witnessed um, in spring 2020 with, black, with, with the protests supporting George Floyd or in support of George Floyd. So in closing, what does it mean then when Yimmy Yan Frankenstein meet? For scholars of the enslaved, it means that in honoring lost souls, it means that one has to contend with an archive of the unimaginable. This task is made even more daunting when conveying the atrocities of slavery to the general public. So like this sculpture from out of the ocean floor, those lost to the slave trade are calling for recognition. And as scholars, we should heed their call. It also, recall, it also means reconcile that some of these forms of black death are man-made. Honoring the dead, especially the enslaved, requires piecing together an archive from those who held, were held captive on land and on waterways. 
and we must wrestle with how to accurately construct the relationship between human bondage, human bondage, memory, and death. We lament and organize in response to the current and consistent devaluation of Black life. So honoring the dead could be a monument. Honoring the dead could be a book. Honoring the dead can even be a special issue of the New York Times Magazine that has been called into question. It also means that we need to reconcile, reconcile the fact that the enslaved are still calling out to for us to tell their stories. It means taking a closer look at the life of people like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. If the past spring has taught us anything internationally, that George Floyd was not silent, was not content being silent. If the spring has taught us anything, George Floyd, who had the air taken out of him, was not content on being silent. And if we look at the continued call for prosecution in Breonna Taylor's case, we see that the notion she's done, the notion that she's done is metaphorically, ethereally, and reality, it is far from true. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Millward. Um, I want to echo her words of appreciation for Dr. Wu and everyone in humanities that, um, and of course the campus has got to put this together. I was born in Hampton, Virginia, which shares a lot of district bounds with the original colony of Jamestown. This is very personally meaningful to be a part of this. Uh, as Dr. Woolward uh, made clear reference to, this project has received pretty intensive pushback and often hyperbolic critique from people claiming it paints too grim a portrait of America and that it posits an American nation that is uh, staunchly anti-democratic, or even evil in its conception, its origins, and its functions. Uh, but in her essay opening the project, Hannah Nicole Jones defies those criticisms quite strongly. She reminisces on her father's relationship to the American flag. He made a point to wave it proudly from their home. She recounts the indignities and the violence that her father and countless other Black people endured while living, working, and fighting in service of a country that never treated them as full, self-actualized members of the polity. She closes that opening essay by boldly and proudly asserting her claim to that American flag and her claim to the label and the promises of being American. I see that as a fundamentally patriotic endeavor in seeking to make space to acknowledge and honor not just the sacrifices and the death, but also the unique contributions and the spirit of America that's been exhibited by Black people since their first arrival on American shores, not just in the literal building of the nation and the building of its wealth, not just in serving and dying for the nation, but in acting as a conscience for the nation, holding up a mirror to America and pressing it to consider how far it falls short of its stated democratic ideals and its constant demigration dehumanization and devaluation of Black people and Black lives and Blackness. To use Jones's words, a major thread of this project is centered around the claim that it is Black people, quote, who have been the perfectors of this democracy, unquote. I see this sentiment as one that resonates uh, broadly with the idea of Black people trying to figure out their place in this American world and who view themselves wrestling with the contingent nature of their Black American identity the duality of and the tension between their blackness and the Americanness. As W.B. Du Bois articulated in the strivings of the Negro people, quote, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And one of the themes that I see emerging in the 1619 Project is that this dogged strength doesn't just keep black people from being torn asunder, it has kept the very nation itself from being torn asunder. Uh, I see this sentiment conveyed in the reflections from a founding member of The Last Poets, Obiadun Oyewole. In commentary, he offers for the documentary, The Black Power Mixtape, which I highly recommend and which you can often find in its entirety on YouTube. Oyewole says, I quote once more, I mean, America is a possibility for everything. America is a young, dumb puppy with teeth that bite and hurt. And we, meaning black people, we take care of America. We hold America to our bosom. We feed America, we make love to America. There wouldn't be an America if it wasn't for black people. And so you have some dedicated black Americans who will die a million deaths to save America. And this is home for us. We don't really know about Africa. We talk about it in a romantic sense, but America is it. And so America is always gonna be okay as long as black people don't totally lose their minds because we'll pick up the new pieces and we'll turn it into a new dance. 
And so I want to acknowledge it can be edifying to champion the distinct roles that have been played by Black Americans as preservers of the union, as perfectors of democracy, as the nation's conscience, as its remakers, remixers, its truest patriots. Uh, but let's acknowledge how exhausting that is. Is the narrative that censors Black Americans as the true upholders of the American dream also a narrative in which Black people can just be? We are American when we toil in uncompensated labor to build the wealth of the empire. We are American when we enlist in the military and fight in US wars at a greater rate than other groups. We are American when we march, when we run, especially to be the first of our kind elected, when we give America the steps to the new dance. But are we American when we reject the call to take up arms in war? Are we American when we choose not to march? Are we American when we refuse to offer up a cathartic display of forgiveness for the many forms of violence often state sanctioned, continuously visit upon Black people? Are we American when we choose to rest? As someone focused on race and politics, I'm often grappling with the various ways that the state makes engaging in the work of politics much more burdensome for Black people. So this is when you talk about elections, Black people wait significantly longer in polling lines to cast their ballot. Black people are disproportionately targeted by, targeted by restrictive voting laws, such as photo ID requirements. Black people tend to be gerrymandered into packed districts that sap them of their true influence over election outcomes. And as we see in recent reports, Black people are continuously micro-targeted with messaging designed to sap them of the motivation to even vote in the first place. Beyond voting, when it comes to engaging directly with political figures, Black people are least likely to receive responses when they contact their elected officials. Waves of, law, waves of laws have been passed in the 21st century, making it more difficult for Black people and others to exercise their First Amendment rights of free assembly. Many states across the nation have passed decrees offering stronger protection for people who hit protesters with their cars than for those protesters themselves. Often when Black people turn their focus to the politics at home, pressing their colleagues and their neighbors to acknowledge and disrupt the anti-Black practices that shape Black people's navigation of their worlds, those neighbors and colleagues, many of whom proudly wave Black Lives Matter flags on their lawns, often react not by labeling Black folks as patriots or perfectors, but rather as overly sensitive or adjectives. Black people continue to battle a phalanx of laws and procedures and practices that make it harder for them to engage the political process on equal footing. As the 1619 Project makes clear, many of those practices and policies either have direct origins or directly or are directly inspired by the tools of control and disenfranchisement created during the era of enslavement. This is exhausting and it's unrelenting and it's often hidden from a collective American gaze, a gaze that continues to cast black people and very often black women specifically as bearing a particular burden to save the country. And we've seen these narratives continue to persist. We need Black folks to vote the right way to save democracy. We need a Black person to moderate the next debate to keep POTUS in check. We need Black people to keep risking their health and their lives to do essential work in the midst of a pandemic, while our collective institutional leadership keeps failing to get that pandemic in check. Perhaps it's no surprise that in my research, when I'm trying to ascertain how people, how Black people respond emotionally to the politics around them, one of the dominant sentiments to emerge is not one of indignation or of anxiety, but of simply being tired. Tired of continuing to bear a burden uh, borne by countless Black people before them. Tired of only being acknowledged as patriots or as true Americans when they bear that burden in full view of the very same polity that makes that burden so heavy. I'm appreciative of the 1619 Project as a historical and educational endeavor that offers a more holistic and a more honest glimpse into the story of America and to the story of the Black people that have been most critical to that. I think it's a glimpse that can help us grapple with the distinct burden that Black people have borne and continue to bear in the ongoing project of the American state. Uh, but I want to close by asking us if we can consider what America looks like if the struggle to realize its lofty goals does not rest so squarely on the shoulders of Black people. If the fight to advance life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness doesn't demand so much blood spilled by Black people, what America would look like when Black people are not cast as its perfectors, but rather its beneficiaries? Is that within or beyond the bounds of our imagination? Is that within or beyond the bounds of our state's capability? So I'm curious how this project can inform our thinking about an entirely new project. Uh, one that not only eschews a romanticiz romanticization of America's past, 
but offers a pathway towards ending the reproduction of the patterns of exploitation and exclusion that continue to persist from that past. How do we honor Black people not simply as laborers, but as visionaries and co-creators in a new project, uh, collaborators in this future-focused project? So as I reflect on the 1619 project, I'm thinking about how we can partner in the making of the 2619 project. Thank you, I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Devin. Um, uh, I want to begin by saying at this moment in the United States, reflections on the 1619 project seem particularly important. President Trump's announcement on September 22nd of his administration's ban on funding for federal contractors who conduct racial sensitivity training is an admission that knowledge is power. Racial sensitive, sensitivity training sessions often share knowledge about social scientific studies uh, of racial uh, bias and try to address those insidious effects. Critical race theory specifically has been attacked over the last couple months for its exploration of histories of colonialism and racism and the continual reverberations of both in contemporary society. It's natural to want to highlight the bright, cheery bits of American history, but to deny the ugliest parts of American hi history simply displays childish denialism and unfounded hope that ignorance truly is bliss. UC Santa Barbara sociologist Avery Gordon in a book titled Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination, suggests that the United States is haunted by racism. Sometimes it seems the specters of past racial injustices in the United States are too frightening to address or too ephemeral to grasp. What the authors who've participated in the 1619 Project have done is engage in conjuring, conjuring up these ghosts. Gordon describes conjuring as, quote, a particular form of calling up and calling out the forces that make things what they are in order to fix and transform a troubling situation. The 1619 Project is an effort to conjure the ghosts of the past, particularly the ghosts of racial othering, racial exploitation, and racial violence. I am a scholar who studies criminal law and began my study of law with the hope that legal reforms might smooth, might pave the way to a more racially just society. Through my studies, however, I've been struck by the ways that law has been used, often in quiet ways, to reimpose structures of inequality. As a professor of law, I spend a lot of time with my students discussing what are commonly described as the nation's founding documents, such as the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. These are aspirational documents, documents that seek to build a country free of oppression, free of tyranny. Black Americans tend to understand the deep hypocrisy reflected in those founding documents, are haunted by the ghosts associated with the founders, particularly uh, the slaves and the unacknowledged children of the founders. The 1619 Project shifts our view from the moments that key documents were drafted and asks us to acknowledge the decisions, the experiences, the moments that may not have been committed to writing or celebrated in high school history books. Much of the history that we do not want to remember is in that project. Um, and it haunts who we are as a country, as a people. While grand documents such as constitutions help order our societies, it tends to be the more mundane laws in the past and today that play the biggest roles in maintaining racial hierarchies. For example, criminal laws have played significant roles in racial othering. The enforcement of criminal laws has fostered beliefs that skin color marks differences in innate morality and that blackness is a mark of moral inferiority. Criminal laws have, been exas have ex long exacerbated material inequalities. 
It has been criminal fines and fees that have kept many Black families in debt, not just recently, but for generations. And criminal laws invite state interactions into Black lives. It isn't violent crime that initiates most contacts between police and Black citizens, but instead minor and routine things such as traffic violations and jaywalking. In the not so distant past, vagrancy laws, loitering, nuisance laws served as invitations for police officers to intervene in the daily lives of Black Americans. And there's a continuity from the past to today. When the population of free Blacks grew in early American history, fears of joint uprising by free Blacks and indentured white servants grew and cross racial relationships were criminalized, right? Control of these marginalized populations was done through criminal law. When the number of free Blacks continued to grow, colonies passed laws raising the costs of marrying legally and making it a criminal act to bear a child out of wedlock. Free Black fathers were then fined for fornication and indentured when they couldn't afford to pay the fines. Many states, eager to find mechanisms to police young Black residents, especially free young Black men, uh, mandated that the non-marital children um, of free Blacks be apprenticed out from childhood to adulthood. Um, so for women, uh, that meant they were often uh, apprenticed and removed from their families from age 12 to 18. For boys, it often meant they were removed from their birth families from age 7 to 21. This not only kept most of the supposedly free young Black men in the South under the oversight of white residents of their communities, it also meant that their labor served the economic interests of white landowners and not their own families. It is the daily lives of the racialized, uh, of those at the racialized margins of American society that are, are often criminalized. The fines and fees of traffic stops and misdemeanors, the child support orders that many young men of color have difficulties fulfilling that are the mechanisms of surveillance and economic extraction today. Most Americans just want to go about their daily lives undisturbed, working, engaging with family, and tending to the necessities of subsistence. The repeated insistence by activists that Black Lives Matter is a sad statement that our society needs to be reminded of that fact. That the demands of Black Lives Matter often come in the contexts of policing is no surprise given the seamless thread of criminal law as a mechanism for social control over African Americans in the United States. Criminal laws have provided justification for humiliation and wealth extraction. And the more recent growth of policing has expanded fears that the enforcement of criminal law will not, not only result in criminal penalties, um, but, will, uh, but will also lead to um, uh, uh, the quotidian experiences of unwanted touch, physical violence, and even death at the hands of state actors. Black lives matter. But for much of American history, Black lives have mattered not because Black Americans are equal Americans, but instead because Black lives are generative, because Black lives serve as sources of extraction. At one point in history, the connection between Black lives and extraction was easier to see when Black, uh, black Americans were working in cotton plantations or in cane fields. It's a bit harder to see when Black Americans serve as a justification for stiff criminal penalties and a vast network of carceral and extra carceral control. Black lives haven't mattered as free and equal lives to white citizens. And that's becoming uh, um, particularly evident in the growth of white nationalist movements in the last couple of years. Blackness has involved a constant struggle to eke out life, a constant struggle to move freely through public spaces without fear of violence, whether state inflicted or state condoned. 
Many of us fear conjuring and confronting the ghosts of American history. Confronting that violence is a part of history and we can only grow stronger for doing so. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Gustafson. Uh, hi, uh, my comments are going to revolve around the 1619 project and the plays of uh, August Wilson. We have the slide presentation up. Can we go back one slide, please? Great, thank you. Um, perhaps one of the most painful and yet profound passages of Nicole Hannah Jones's essay and the 1619 Project is an articulation of the 12.5 million souls that were brought across the Atlantic Ocean during the Middle Passage and the 2 million souls who were lost during the voyage. As we are witnessing right now, the water and the ocean is in fact a contested space of memory, trauma, loss, and healing. Jones writes, they say our people were born on the water. When it occurred, no one can say for certain, but perhaps it was in the second week or the third, but surely by the fourth, when they had not seen their land or any land for so many days, they lost count. It was after fear had turned to despair and despair to resignation and resignation to an abiding understanding. The teal eternity of the Atlantic Ocean had severed them so completely from what had once been their home that it was as if nothing had ever existed before, as if everything and everyone they cherish had simply vanished from the earth. They were no longer Mbundu or Akan or Fulani. These men and women from many different nations all shackled together in the suffocating hull of the ship. They were one people, end quote. So they say that there is this trail of bones made from the bodies of those who did not survive the journey across the Atlantic. One could easily assume that they have been forgotten. U.S. history simply does not want to acknowledge the rupture and the break of the Middle Passage and often attempts to erase the memory of its tragic events through the denial of black lives. The very nature of anti-blackness means that it is dangerous, in fact, lethal to simply consider a world where black lives matter. And so what is to be done? We need black arts and black publics. Next slide of August Wilson, please. Similar to Nicole Jones's 1619 Project, the playwright, poet, storyteller, essayist, and activist, the late August Wilson, wrote a cycle of decade plays that were intended to capture the struggle of both the comedy and the tragedy of Black life in America. Wilson's canon of dramatic writing revealed how communities of disembodied and dismembered people have engaged in varying forms of counter discourse and struggle that have sought to repair, restore, and heal the experiences of the Middle Passage, chattel slavery, Jim Crow racism, and the racism of the 20th century and the 21st century. Specifically, two of Wilson's plays, Jim of the Ocean and Joe Turner's Come and Gone, engage directly with the rupture and trauma of the Middle Passage and the violence of anti-Blackness. Hence, much in the same way that the Since 1619 Project attempts to reframe the conversation around the experience of Black people in the Americas as not being rooted in, 16, in 1776, but rather in the earliest days of the colonies, Wilson's cycle of decade plays attempted to create and to heal communities. The portfolio of dramatic writing included the following titles and their corresponding decades. Next slide, please. 1900, Jim of the Ocean. 1910, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. 1920, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. 1930s, the piano lesson for which he won a Pulitzer Prize. 1940s, seven guitars. 1950s, fences for which he was again awarded the Pulitzer Prize. Two trains running. 1960s. 1970s, Jitney. 1980s, King Headley II. 
and 1990s radio golf. Wilson's plays were indicative of the way in which drama can function as a kind of cultural memory that is understood as the ways in which practices and acts of imagination and interconnection that are embodied in sensual conjure and evoke memory in conjunction with other recollections to create a lifeline between the past, present, and the future. And much like the way that the 1619 Project attempts to intervene into the erasure of Black lives, Wilson's plays were also interventions in a form of critical ethnography in which he inscribed the voices that he heard into the plays based on the people whom he met in the hill area of Pittsburgh where he was raised and where the plays Jim of the Ocean and Joe Turner's Come and Gone were set. Next slide, please, the four Bs. Wilson's writing was also influenced by the four Bs, black arts poet, and Black Arts Revolutionary Theater founder, Amiri Baraka, the Argentine short story writer, Jorge Luis Borges, the African-American painter and Pittsburgh-based painter, Romare Bearden, and of course, the blues, which undergirded all of Wilson's work as both poetry, historical figures, and the transformation of the blues sound into political power. These artistic influences converged with Wilson's belief that African-American diasporic spiritual practices that he believed were kept alive through the middle of passage and reemerged in the colonies as amalgamated ritual practices that borrowed from Christianity, voodoo, and Yoruba. Next slide, Jim of the Ocean, please. While Wilson's plays were all set in the 20th century, the conditions and characters within his dramas were always living within and across the African diasporic continuum. Set in 1904 in Pittsburgh, Jim of the Ocean brings to life the contested contradictions of black strivings through the character of Esther Tyler or Aunt Esther, who according to the original script that Wilson wrote is not only 285 years old, but also a spiritual worker capable of guiding people to the magical city of bones. Aunt Esther's age means that she literally embodies the spirits of the Africans who arrived in 1619, but also is capable to summon the collective cultural memory of what happened to the ancestors who did not make it through the Middle Passage and can also reconstruct the linkage to those ancestors who reside in the city of bones. Aunt Esther is someone who not only guides people, but much like the character of Ma Rainey, and by extension, I would argue Nicole Hannah-Jones, Aunt Esther is an individual who helps organize and heal community through her practice, such as the case when a recently arrived migrant from Alabama named Citizen Barlow comes to Aunt Esther's home in search of redemption. He comes in research of redemption to have his soul washed for the guilt he feels when another man perishes after he refused to confess to a petty theft that Citizen had in fact committed. Aunt Esther performs a ritual enactment with her protege, Black Mary, and other members from the community. She provides citizens with the original bill of sale from when she was sold as a slave. Aunt Esther's bill of sale then, so, bill of sale then serves as the paper boat, the gem of the ocean that citizen must sail upon in order to reach the city of bones where he can wash his soul and be remade a new man in fact, a citizen of the people. Hence, citizen is not only redeemed by his inability to speak, but the ritual act of going to the city of Bones enables him to become part of the community in Pittsburgh, a process that was essential for black migrants who left the agricultural South, seeking a new life free from the terrors of white violence. Next slide, Joe Turner's come and gone, please. The drama, of Joe Turner's Come and Gone was set in 1911 and takes place in a boarding house in Pittsburgh where an ensemble of characters converge in the residence of Seth Holly, who runs the boarding house with his wife, Bertha. Romare Bearden's painting, The Prevalence of Ritual, which is a collage of characters in search of their voices served as inspiration for the play. And similar to Jim of the Ocean, the catalyst of the play is when the character Harold Loomis arrives in search of his voice and his wife after he was stolen in Memphis, Tennessee and placed on a chain gang for seven years. 
The play's title is a reference to the blues singer, Joe Turner, and also the Memphis Sheriff, Joe Turney, who snatched black men off the streets and put them on chain gangs. And the title, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, is also a lament for the husbands and sons and brothers who had been snatched up and carried away by Joe Turner. Similar to Jim of the Ocean, the play stage is a reclamation of the Middle Passage, wherein Seth Holly's family and the residents of his boarding house engage in a juba, a kind of dance reminiscent of what Wilson described in the stage directions as a slave ring shout. The ritual infuriates the character of, Jim, of Harold Loomis, who bursts into the kitchen distress that the community has engaged in the ritualistic practice and called upon the Holy Ghost. Loomis is at once enraged and possessed and begins speaking in tongues. His experience is supposed to embody an amalgamation of Christianity, Yoruba, and voodoo in which the character of Bynum, who much like Aunt Esther is a roots worker and conjurer, stands over him attempting to ease his anxiety. The two engage in a spirited call and response as Bynum beckons and guides Loomis through a vision in which Loomis experiences a vision in which he describes bones rising up out of the water, which then begin to walk across the water, bones walking on top of the water. For Loomis, it is a place where the water is bigger than the whole world and the bones walk on top of it, walking without sinking down, walking on top of the water, marching in a line, a whole heap of them, one after another, after another, after another, and then they sunk down all at one time. They just fell in the water at one time. A big wave washed over the land. It washed over them out of the water and up onto the land so that they aren't bones anymore, but now have become black flesh. Much like Citizen's redemptive journey to the city of bones under the guidance of Aunt Esther, Loomis's vision is hastened. It is hastened by the conjurer of Bynum who has enabled Loomis to have the vision of bones emerging from the water, walking across the water and onto the shores. Through the symbolic action of the Juba and his vision of the lost souls of the Middle Passage, Loomis is able to cut himself free of his past and find his own voice of hope for the future. Last slide, please, the prevalence of ritual. Wilson's use of imagery of the middle passage in Joe Turner's Come and Gone and Gem of the Ocean was not only a matter of representation created by a plethora of actors who communed to create the work, but in fact were generative and therapeutic descriptions and prescriptions of how black people have continually mobilized to reclaim their rightful place in the world by advocating for themselves and exercising agency under the most horrendous of conditions. In turn, August Wilson himself and the many actors, directors, and theater workers that he collaborated with turned the proscenium stage into a catalyst for political change. Much in the same way that the 1619 Project demands that we reconsider and rearticulate a new epistemological framework for the contested history of the US, so too did Wilson advocate for a new understanding of US cultural formation in his polemic essay, The Ground on Which I Stand, in which Wilson called for a national Black repertory theater that was capable of sustaining the development of Black voices. Similar to the 1619 Project, Wilson's polemic essay was met with hostility and disdain by white theater critics who seemed incapable of conceding that the racial wealth gap of today has its origins in the colonies of 1619 and resulted in the lack of funding for black arts, a dearth of black stories and the continued suffocation of black lives. What we need and what we demand are black arts and black publics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, this has been really powerful and um, I am already starting to see the ways that, um, that everyone's reflections are sort of interacting with each other. Um, and so I just wanted to do a time check at six o'clock. My understanding is that what we are going to do is sort of 
uh, bring together the Q&A along with um, what was supposed to be a sort of breakout broader discussion um, session with, um, with Dr. Miguel Hernandez and Dr. Maria Gracia Simon. Um, and so if I am correct in that, say nothing. And if I'm mistaken, um, let me know organizers of the event in some way. And so what I will do is I am going to just introduce um, Dr. Hernandez and Dr. Gracias uh, Sinon. Um, and I'm also looking at the um, Q&A section of Zoom so that folks who have questions um, might be um, placing them in that Q&A section and we will be sort of um, tending to that and, and facilitating conversation. And so I'll just sort of start off and, and then um, we'll look at Q&A. Um, so first of all, just to, just to start us off, um, Dr. Miguel uh, Angel Hernandez is a native of Puerto Rico and identifies as Afro-Caribbean. As a first generation college student, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Justice Administration from Columbus State University, Justice Administration, hmm, I like that, um, and a Master of Arts uh, degree in College Student Development from Appalachian State University. Most recently, he completed his doctoral degree in higher education at Florida State University. His research focused on DACA students in Florida who engaged in social activism. Dr. Hernandez currently serves as the Associate Dean of Students um, at UC uh, Irvine. And then um, Dr. Maria Gracia Sinon um, earned her PhD in French um, language and literature from the University of Buffalo, the State University of New York. Um, she researches the body aesthetics and oppression of transnational black women and feminism in Francophone Sub-Saharan Africa and Francophone uh, Caribbean. Um, so maybe I will just get us started and then um, then I'll take a, a second to look at the Q&A and move on from there. So I just wanted to bring together um, some themes that I'm seeing in, in everyone's um, reflections, right? Um, starting with Jessica's focus on black death, the specter of black death, death as a pr protagonist, right? And, and what sort of historical imaginations can emerge if we begin um, to center the violence of, of Black death, um, and in particular, sort of the physical condition, conditions of Black women, such as Angela um, in early colonial Virginia. And so this, this sort of notion of, uh, of the material conditions, right, of Black people um, within the U.S., um, which moves us uh, sort of to, um, to Davin's focus. You know, what I took from it was a sort of parasitic relationship of US democracy with black people, right? Um, Karen's um, notion that black lives matter when blackness generates capital, right? And then um, this really interesting and beautiful sort of meditation from Wilson on rethinking citizenship, right? In relationship, you know, the citizenship in relationship to the selling of black people and the bill of sale. And so I'm wondering if we might just start really quickly and then move to, you know, to Q&A around sort of a reflection on what citizenship and the nation um, can come to mean through looking at the 1619 Project, right? Which centers the United States and, and sort of a dependence on black people for, for a sort of perfection of de democratic citizenship, you know? But is there something in, you know, the work of Wilson in the experiences of Angela in, in sort of, um, what is going on in Black Lives Matter movements that is absolutely about citizenship, but then also maybe exceeds citizenship or exceeds the nation, right? And this sort of dependent relationship, parasitic relationship on Black people. So I don't know if there's anyone who wants to start with that and then we'll... We 
was that too much to start with and we can move to Q&A? <laughs> now so I know what my students feel like. Could you just give it a little bit more concisely? I, I, can, I can. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this concisely and then maybe Zachary can start, which is does a 1619 project leave us at black folks perfecting the democratic project or the project of citizenship? Or can we take it and think through Black experience, both material and discursive, as moving us beyond sort of the, the limits of citizenship? I think that, um, just to kind of jump off, I think that what's going on in Jim of the Ocean is the very notion that citizenship is, is a contested concept, right? That it's, it's limited to people when, oftentimes when the state deems it valuable to be limited to folk, to people. And then when those bodies, whomever they may be, are have some kind of material value, then citizenship and the performance of citizenship becomes incredibly important. I think that's specifically to your point, um, uh, I think Wilson was also gesturing towards the ways in which the, the citizenship of this character is, is, is about the local politics of this community. Right and and the struggle um, to not only redeem oneself for a transgression that has been made, but also and hence be made whole again, but also to redeem, as we're saying right now, perhaps the soul of of our I wouldn't say this nation, I won't say this country, but our our our, our global experience. And I, I guess um, I will take it. Uh, 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 the opportunity to try and answer. <laughs> I think that um, in some ways the 1619 project does exactly what Davin had said, which is it tries to absolve black people of doing all, all the work. And um, in some ways, because there's been such a broad base appeal to the project, I think that's the brilliance of the 1619 project. So many people have, have, have gathered around it in the public space Right, it was a great tool to start changing or at least educating the public about the experiences of enslavement. So in some ways, I think it, it absolves black people of doing most of the work, but in other ways, I feel like because of the, the essential nature of anti-blackness to the American experience, that um, black citizenship becomes the crucible that everything else is tested against, or rather, it's the examples of ways in which the citizenship of black people are not honored becomes kind of a, a, a way in which to measure the ways in which um, citizenship is not working. Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense. Sounded great to me. The lawyer's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'll step back. <laughs> no, just jump in because I think like I'm processing thoughts similar, I think, to both how Jessica and Zach are processing. It's like, Sandra, I think that's a really excellent question. And I really felt like I grasped it and resonated with my thinking, but it's really difficult, I think, to consider. I think there's so many layers, not only in terms of thinking about the kind of contested or contingent nature of Black people's relationship to citizenship, but also the ways in which I think Black, the Black struggle for liberation has been one that has very often not looked to attain full citizenship, right? But has looked to destroy and remake the state in an image, right? In which black people can truly be uh, kind of like, you know, visionaries fully realized. And I think I see that tension playing out right now. When we think about this kind of reawakened moment of black activism and how there's this like imposition, right? Of Black activists and people in solidarity, activist ways of thinking through reimagining the state and how that's entering into the mainstream political lexicon. So I think about the contrast between how often we were talking about in kind of mainstream discursive circles, abolition, right? Like police abolition and other forms of abolition. We had an entire season that felt like multiple years of democratic debates, right? Where there was nary one mention of abolition, even as they talked about race and the state of black America. So I think we're seeing so rapidly the kind of ways in which uh, these kind of liberatory spaces and movements and discursives, our discussions 
are so often kind of beyond the bounds for me as a political scientist of the kind of political playing field. And there's still this pushing, this pushing, this pushing. And so I think oftentimes that pushing is framed uh, inaccurately, like as a push for like full rights of citizenship, however we're defining that legal, social, political. And oftentimes people doing that pushing and leading that pushing saying, no, no, we don't want <laughs> citizenship within the state, right? We want to reimagine the state entirely. And I think that speaks to another way of thinking about that contested citizenship. It's not just the ways in which people continue to get denied the opportunity to have kind of full rights and privileges, but also the way in which even movements that try to push us beyond that are framed inaccurately, which has these persistent effects. Okay. Thank you. Um, and again, we'll just sort of have this as an open um, conversation. So I'll read the next question and then um, participants feel free to jump in um, as you see fit. Um, so the next question is from Dr. Tiffany willoughby -Hurrard. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, it says, seeing a bridge between this idea of, quote, she's not done, Jessica, that you read, um, and quote, being co-creators, visionaries of the future, right? And um, quote, knowledge being the power to eke out our life, right? And finally, quote, coming to voice. So here's the question, um, sort of meditating on all of those things. Uh, the question is, how do we embrace our capacity? I'm, I'm imagining the we is Black peoples, um, um, Black diasporic peoples. How do we embrace our capacity for, quote, not being done so that it serves us more or most or primarily? I mean, I think that that uh, you know, not being done means that we are continually invested in learning, in learning from each other, um, in producing knowledge. Um, uh, but that means th that people need to uh, uh, give us opportunities to speak, right? But that we need to be at the table at, at universities. Uh, we need to be included on panels, um, uh, and we need to be read. Um, uh, you know, uh, but part of that means that uh, our works need to be at, assigned throughout the curriculum, right? That. Um, Black folks need to be part of the scholarly conversation in all parts of the university. I mean, I, I guess what I, I will say, and first of all, it was an, an excellent question. So we've already had two excellent questions that are forcing us to rethink the entire state of, of this country. So what can I say to you? Um, in some ways, by saying um, it's not done, it's, it, we're still talking about these, these um, legacies that are not fulfilled, right? I mean, is the fate of African-Americans in particular to always be dealing with these unfulfilled promises of American democracy? Um, I mean, I'm a historian, so I can only tell you what's happened across time. I can't necessarily tell you about where we are, we are going forward. But I have enjoyed the comments of um, my co-panelists to start thinking about ways in which we can kind of change how the pieces fit together. So that's a long answer to say, Tiffany Willie Bruhard, I that was a great question. I have no immediate plans to uh, for how change can happen. I'll just super quickly say what that makes me think about is how I think it really resonate with a lot of the comments of my co-panelists, the idea or the kind of framework of ontology and the ways in which we can consider the haunting of past generations and not haunting like in a negative way, right? But really informing and illuminating and like 
people that have died giving us life. And I've been thinking about that more in relationship to my own work. Like in political science, we'll think about socialization and how the narratives and ideas around blackness that you pick up from your parents' generation or your cohort around you really shape how you navigate blackness. And I'm thinking beyond kind of that way. In what way, right, uh, does Angela Hunton inform us and shape our ways of thinking, navigating? In what ways does Breonna Taylor haunt us and inform us and illuminate our ways of thinking? In what ways do we, even in the midst of our state of being tired and fatigued, mm -hmm. consider the burden we face to uh, kind of take ownership of her narrative and her legacy and the legacy of those that have come before us? I know if others watch the BP debates, I saw on my social media feed a lot of recoiling when the vice president mentions Breonna's name and saying that's you don't have the right to mention that name. I think that informs what I'm thinking about with you're not done, right? Well, what do we do with the legacy and with the story and understanding how Brianna's story and her life and her death is so fundamentally linked to the stories of black life and death in America. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those um, uh, very insightful thoughts and the questions again um, from our participants. Um, I'm excited to share the next one for our panelists to consider. Um, and I think it's a very intriguing question. I have engaged with this question in different settings, so I'm excited to learn more about what we might uh, uh, come up with together. The question is, uh, is there a specific historical or sociological reason why the death along the Middle Passage and the crimes against Black people during colonial America are primarily considered the historical or emotional baggage of the United States and not the United Kingdom. I mention this because it seems like the idea of the national responsibility or guilt is premised upon national identity and that concept um, is of a unique American identity wasn't immediately apparent in 1619. Uh, question from our participant, Joshua Swank. Thank you for that question. Everyone looks to the slavery scholar. Um, Slavery in the US system differed in shape and kind to other places. I think there's something that is, there is something about the US experience. If we were to draw a chart about uh, looking at how many people actually came to the US compared to other places in the Caribbean and in South America, the, the smallest number of Africans arrived in the US and the US's race problem seems to be that that problem, right, as, 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 as Myrdal talked about, seems to be the problem that plagues everywhere. I guess one of the things I would say, and you know this from going through the diaspora, there's been systems in place um, after emancipation, be it formal apprenticeships or what have you. Um, there have been places set aside for formerly enslaved people to enter and transition into society and not in a way that, um, I'm not saying that every every post emancipation moment everywhere was was um, the same. What I'm saying is there's something particularly unique, particularly unique about the the notion of uh, natural reproduction or under the British system coming to the United States. I don't know if it was because the United States for the most part is landlocked when you get across from the coast. I don't know if it's because slaveholders in some places were more present. Um, but you can't deny that for whatever reason, race and how we talk about race and the long legacy of slavery take shape differently in the US. Um, but there are also other places, if you go to some of the um, uh, uprisings that in the wake of George Floyd have triggered a moment to take down statues in the UK. In Liverpool, um, there was a statue of a slaver that was taken down. We have other places where the voices of black people are, are being heard in, in different kinds of ways. So, I mean, this is a question I ask my students all the time. What, how do we make sense of the fact that the small, still a lot, but the smallest number of Africans arrived in the US? And, and it's a great question. We could stay here all day. I don't really have that answer either. Can I say something, even though I'm moderator? 
Yeah, <laughs> just to add to that, which is, I think, um, this was a question um, by Joshua Smith. So I think that part of it is also a question of where you situate origin, right? Yeah. So if we situated um, the, the origin of the story at 1441, when Portuguese first um, take uh, enslaved Africans um, from uh, what is to be called Senegal to Portugal, or if we situate um, the conversation um, a little bit later in 1528, when um, enslaved Africans were taken to New Spain or Mexico for the first time, right? We might be situating a sort of a different conversation here. And then we might be thinking about this transatlantic slave trade, right? Um, and the Mediterranean as a hemispheric or a global problem of trafficking in Africans, right? And that sort of a conversation then helps us to think about, you know, what citizenship might, might look like if we have that conversation, um, but also sort of what, uh, what, what black life matters could mean sort of in a broader sense beyond, beyond the US. And all of that to say that um, this does not let an American sort of project off the hook right, for what its, um, what its role sort of in destiny has, has come through, through, through the violence, the material violence on black people. I, I would like to, I, I would like to just pick it up a little from the Francophone perspective, um, because France actually also kind of has received criticism um, about how they engage with um, the history of slavery. Um, and so um, to the point that even um, the you know, immigrants kind of talk about how when they, their families immigrate to, to France, they don't feel that they're French. Um, even if their, their families have immigrated a generation ago and um, they, they, then the kids are born in France, there's still kind of this otherness placed upon them, even though they've been born um, in France, they grew up there with the culture, but there's a, there's a difference because of their skin color. And so France has been criticized, criticized a bit about the, 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 the relation between citizenship and race. And so that's also, that, that made me think about uh, the, the question a bit because uh, we're talking within the anglophone context and there's that kind of and and there's been a lot of movements in, in a few movements in france have been kind of that have used the united states as a blueprint to kind of bring that into um into to the the metropolitan france um space to kind of um to to also ask for the, the that that um those benefits of said democracy um, and so um, human rights, civil rights, et cetera. So I just wanted to add that. And um, I would also like to move uh, to um, share one of the questions that we received from Heather Fessler. Um, are we worried about federal funding ramifications of the teaching of teaching 1619 based on Trump's new edict? Um, I would think not. But what about schools and college without UC systems power? Well, I'll touch on that. Um, uh, you know, universities are are built to teach ideas, and I don't know how you separate. Um, uh, one idea from another. So I think, you know, this, this rule uh, will be that that's come down from above on decree will be hard um, to enforce. And I don't know that um, specific uh, attacks on the 1619 project um, uh, could be possible because that's, that would be quite uh, a significant regulation of, of particular speech and viewpoints. Um, 
Uh, I just wanted to note that, you know, although there has been this call to do away with, you know, teaching critical race theory uh, at universities, uh, the law students across the UC law schools have gotten together and signed a letter, not only saying they want critical race theory to be taught, but they want it incorporated into their curriculum more thoroughly. So, you know, there is heavy resistance on the ground um, to uh, uh, the calls from above to do away with um, teaching certain topics. And that makes me hopeful, right? It, it may actually be sparking a movement rather than quelling speech. I, I just have a caveat. I was um, asked to speak at another institution and I received today in my mailbox an email about the most recent presidential mandate about what will be discussed and what will not be discussed in terms of incendiary language, in terms of um, singling one group out, what have you, what have you, what have you. So it's a nine point platform. So the 1619 project is actually in, in company with a, a, an, an entire movement to, to restructure how we, how we think about talking about race and moving through some of these problems together. I mean, if you can't have a conversation, you can't get on the board to have the conversation, how, how, can, you, how can you promote change? Anyone else? I add to that. Okay, so it's 628 and I have um, a desire to keep having uh, more questions and, and keep this conversation going, but um, I probably should not force everyone to do so on my behalf. Um, so I just wanted to make some final announcements before um, we head out. Um, and that is that, um, so there's no, so there's no um, further discussion afterwards um, is my understanding, but um, there is another event on uh, October 13th on designing the narrative. I don't know if there's a slide that wants, that you wanna put up there, uh-huh. Featuring the 1619 Project artist, John Key and animator, Taylor Shaw. Um, I'll wait a, a second for that. Uh-huh, there's the slide. Um, and so we would encourage you to register for that and attend. Um, we will be circulating a post-event survey, which you should get via email. And we're hoping that you um, take time to fill that out and let us know how things went. And then last two um, asks of the evening um, are one, please con complete the census, right? Um, the census will continue until October 31st. There's no panel there, but I, I wonder if in the chat, you can put the, um, the link to the website for the census, which is, I'll just say really quickly, 2020census.gov, 2020census.gov. And the final thing is that we um, would encourage you all to register to vote. If you haven't yet, you can do so online through October 19th and then in person after that. I don't know how you vote in or register to vote in person, but um, maybe a quick Google search will help with that. Um, there is a link to a website, which is registertovote.ca.gov register to vote.ca.gov. Um, we'd like to thank our panelists and um, uh, Maria and also Miguel for joining us. And we look forward to the next event on October 13th. Thank you.